Well, good morning. I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. How many of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving? Would you just uh, clap your hands if you did? Amen. I mean, we had a great time in our family. We had 30-some people over at our house. I don't even know the names of a lot of them, but they were all over there. And they said they were family, right? So we let them in. Now, we had a great time together. How many of you watched some football over the weekend? Would you raise your hand? Oh, wow. Hey, that, that got a bigger rise than Thanksgiving did for you guys. How many of you were watching all seven of the overtimes last night? Would you raise your hand? All right, that's great, that's great. That means that you really won't mind if I go seven overtimes in my message today, right? You stayed, you watched, it doesn't matter how long I go, as long as you're still in the game, right? Uh, what a game, what a game. And I noticed that not one person in that whole stadium left during that game. They, they were riveted there uh, to the end, what a game it was. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something that we don't often do, but uh, if you have your Bibles, if you have it on, on iPhone or your tablet or your leather band, whatever, just hold it up if you have your Bible today. Would you do that? Hold it up high. Would you do that? That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Esther today as we have our final message in the book of Esther. And uh, the title of the message is When All is Said and Done. It's a great, great study we've had over the last eight weeks. This is the ninth message in the book of Esther, uh, covering all 10 chapters, and it really is an amazing book. I say that about every book that I preach through, but I really feel that uh, each time, because every time you open the Word of God, it's really amazing how relevant the Bible is for our times. Everything that we've dealt with in the book of Esther is something we're dealing with in our culture today. Misogyny, uh, objectifying women, uh, racism, uh, there was all kinds of stuff about wickedness and, and evil, pride and arrogance. All those things are dealt with in the book of Esther. It's really amazing. And so I'm kind of sad to come to the end of it, but we'll be getting into our Advent or our Christmas uh, series next week. But what a great book. Let's stand as we read a few verses out of chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Again, the title is, When All is Said and Done. We'll read the first nine or first five verses of chapter 9. And then we'll pick up a few selected verses in the remaining part of that chapter. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar, on the thirteenth day, when the king's command and edict were about to be executed, on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them. This was called the day of Pur, P-U-R, because it represents the word lottery. It was the day that the lottery basically landed on that particular day as a day when Haman's edict would be determined uh, as law where people could come and kill all the Jewish people. This was Haman's racism spelled out. But then it says this. It says, it was turned to the contrary. All of a sudden, everything's flipped upside down, which is the message of the book of Esther, that God can turn something that seemingly is impossible, upside down. So, so it was turned to the contrary so that the Jews themselves gained the mastery over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hand on those who sought their harm. And since no one could stand before them, for the dread of all them had fallen on the peoples, even the princes of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and those who were doing the king's business, assisted the Jews because the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. Indeed, Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces for the man Mordecai became greater and greater. Now, what a different story than that which we hear in the first three chapters of the book of Esther, where Mordecai is hated by Haman. Haman is rising, Haman is elevating, Haman's hatred and wickedness are being spread, and Mordecai is targeted as one who's going to be hung from gallows 80 feet high. Of course, he never hangs from those gallows. Look at, with me at a couple of other verses, beginning in verse 23 of chapter 9. Thus the Jews undertook what they started to do, what Mordecai had written to them, for Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the adversary of all the Jews, had schemed against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pure, that is the lot, to disturb them and destroy them. But when it came to the king's attention, he commanded by letter that his wicked scheme, which he had devised against the Jews, should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows, those same 80-foot tall gallows that were in his backyard and had been built for Mordecai, they hung on. Wow, what a change. Verse 28, verse 28. So verse 28 says, So these days were to be remembered 
and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. And these days of Purim, you notice the name changes, from Pur to Purim were not to fail from among the Jews or their memory fade from their descendants. Then lastly, verse 32, the command of Esther established these customs for Purim and it was written in the book. So instead of a day of devastation and destruction, it was a day of celebration because God had rescued them. If you like that story, say amen. Amen. Man, what a story. Father, today help us to see this story and how you play it in our own lives. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. Now, I told you in this culture series week after week, I, I said this, and I'm repeating myself frequently when I say, you know, somebody ought to make a movie about this book. It's really incredible. And movies have been made, and, uh, and some of those movies, I've watched some of those over the recent months because it's such a great, great story. How God can flip things upside down. But as I read through the book of Esther, King Ahasuerus and Mordecai and Haman and Esther uh, become figures in my mind. Uh, and I kind of want to put faces to them. So some of our debate over the last few weeks is who would we play uh, in those roles if we had a chance to do it. So I'm going to give you my, my picks here. So if I did a movie of the book of Esther, King Ahasuerus would be Yule Brenner. Put a picture of Yule Brenner up there. Now that looks like King Ahasuerus right there. Now, some of you don't know who Yule Brenner is, and that's okay. We don't have time to explain that. But he was a, a great actor at some point in the past. And then I was looking for some Jewish man to be Mordecai, and I did not know that Harrison Ford was Jewish. And so Harrison Ford, uh, if I'm casting, is going to be that man Mordecai. For Esther, uh, my wife and I had a conversation about this because um, this, this girl is a Jewish girl as well. She played in Wonder Woman. Her name is uh, Gal Gadot. And so she is Wonder Woman. When I, when I said to my wife, are you sure that you think she ought to play in the book of Esther. She goes, well, Esther was Wonder Woman, don't you think? And I said, well, I guess so. So that worked. But for Haman, I have to stick with Jack Nicholson. And the reason I want Jack Nicholson to be Haman is because he can't handle the truth. That's the, that's the reason why. So these are the guys that play in, uh, in my movie if I'm playing it. But of course, I'm not a producer. I'm keeping my day job here as a pastor. And so we're going to get to our text today. These characters... God used to bring some incredible truth to us that is relevant for us today. I want to summarize some of those things. Here, here's, here's a summary of where we're headed today. The summary is it's not over till God speaks. It's not over till God speaks. It's not over till God acts. Everything else that you see playing in your life, every, every other storyline that's coming at you, everything that you're watching unfold around you, it's not over until God acts, until God does what God will finally do. And it's by faith that we approach it like that. If we had have concluded the summary of Esther's life in chapter 3, what a bad story. If we had have concluded Mordecai's life in chapter 3, what a bad story. Because we would have been given up on what God was about to do. But if you had only read chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Esther, the rise of Haman, the wickedness and the evil schemes that he had, and how he had hemmed Mordecai all around with wickedness and evil and hatred, the gallows were built. It seemed certain that this story was not going to end well. But here's the truth for you. Even when God appears to be absent, he's undoubtedly present and absolutely powerful. Write that down. You're gonna need to write that down in the margins of your Bible. You're gonna need to have that truth to hold on to in time when nothing else seems to be making sense and nothing else seems to be going your way. Even when God appears to be absent, he's undoubtedly present and absolutely powerful. No one can hold his plans back at all, at all. Do you believe that truth today? This is an amazing truth that we have to embrace if we believe the size of our God, the infiniteness of our God. He's able to do anything. He causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, even when you don't see him. Now, the book of Esther is that book where God's name is not mentioned. And no place in the book of Esther do we see a line that says they prayed to God, even though we believe that they did. And no place does it say that God intervened, even though he clearly did. God is not visible in the book of Esther, but he's clearly in charge. 
and clearly active. So with that in mind, let's look at three things, three lessons that we can learn from God's ways. By the way, God's way is always perfect. His timing is always uh, complete. And when all is said and done, he leaves us with some great ways to live. Here's way number one. The power and influence of a great woman is undeniable. You cannot escape the fact, nor do we want to escape the fact that this book is about a young woman, perhaps 14 years of age when she was asked to be in this beauty contest that eventually landed her a spot in the castle with the king. She was the queen. And there's no doubt that God allowed her to be placed in that position. And four years into that, she's 18 years of age, making incredible decisions to rescue the entire race of Jewish people. And as you look at this young woman named Esther, you're astounded by her wisdom and her confidence. And so the point that the scripture, the book is making for us here is that there's an incredible power and influence in a great woman. You can't debate it. It's wonderful to see. Go back to chapter four for a moment. Three verses that characterize her life. This is when Haman is threatening Mordecai. Mordecai comes to Esther and he shares these words with her in verse 14. She's already the queen, but she's in that really difficult spot of not knowing how to approach the king, not knowing how to appeal to her people. And here's what Mordecai, her adoptive father, says to her. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. In other words, God does not have to use you. He doesn't have to use you, but he wants to use you. And if you choose not to be used, then he'll, he'll raise up a, a rescuer from someone else and you and your father's house will perish. But then he says this, he says, and who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. That's verse 15. And here's what she says in verse 16. Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my maidens will fast in the same way. And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And here are these last few words that are so powerful, so courageous. And she says, and if I perish, I perish. Say those words with me. If I perish, I perish. That's commitment. That's dedication. That's putting your life out there. That's saying, God, I don't know what you're up to and I don't know how this thing's gonna end. I might die, but I'm gonna step out and I'm going to believe you. Let me just share some things about this woman's life real quickly. She sought and trusted God. That's clear. She said, I'm gonna fast for three days. I want you to fast for three days. My maidens are gonna fast for three days. Mordecai, go tell all the Jews to fast for three days. Now, the fasting for a Jewish person was not a matter of just withholding food. It was a time of seeking God. So even though it doesn't say pray and fast or seek God and fast, that's clearly what they were doing. So she sought God. She trusted God. Secondly, she called others to pray. She said, look, this is the dilemma we're in. I don't have the answers, but I have enough wisdom to know that God does have the answers. So I'm asking you, everyone, to pray. Thirdly, she acted courageously in faith. She stepped out there and said, if I perish, I perish. Now, it's hard for us to get beyond these words, but this woman was saying words that could literally have placed her in a death grip. The king could have killed her just for approaching him. These are real words. These are not just words. These are words that really had a price tag attached to them. So that's what I call courage. Isn't it incredible that God uses people like this young woman? It's hard for us to imagine someone so young being used like that. But Esther is proof in the New Testament and the Old Testament rather and verified in the New that God calls women to do some of the most significant work on the planet. No matter what you see in your culture, no matter what, no matter what you hear around you, just, just remember this. If you see one thing and God does something else, go with what God's doing. If you hear one thing and, and hear God say something else, go with what God's saying. Always side with God. And what God is saying to us here in the book of Esther is that he can, he can use a woman for anything he wants to use her for on this planet Earth. And it's really amazing. If you don't believe God, you're gonna miss out on some things in life. You're gonna miss out on some opportunities. I love how, how God uses women. I, I love how God used a number of women in my life. My wife is an amazing woman. 
I tell stories about her all the time. I probably haven't told many stories about my, my mom. My mom was an incredible lady. She was a Baptist pastor's wife. My dad was a Baptist pastor until he died about a year or so ago. And uh, so she was that, uh, that pastor's wife that did everything. She raised two boys, my, myself and my brother. And, um, and then she also did everything in the church. This was an era where the pastor's wife usually was the one that played the piano on Sunday morning. You know, a small Oklahoma church, pastor, pastor's wife, it was a dynamic duo, one-two punch, right? It was a team. And, and if she couldn't play the piano, he probably wasn't going to be called to preach at that church, right? It was something like that. She led the WMU. Some of you don't know what the Women's Missionary Union is. I... As a boy, I used to go to WMU meetings because my mom was leading them. And, and we didn't have child care sometimes in those days. And so child care was, you sit in this chair until this meeting's over with a bunch of women. I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> so that was my upbringing. My mom was an amazing woman. At the same time she was raising us, she was the VP of a bank in that small town. And then the day came when my dad was called to First Baptist Church, Provo, Utah. If you don't know where Provo, Utah is, let me just say, it's right there where the Brigham Young University campus is in the heart of Mormon country. And First Baptist Church, Provo, Utah, was a little church right on the corner of the campus of the University of, of Brigham Young. And in that day, in the 80s, um, Mormons were not born into Baptist or any other Christian group for that matter. In fact, my dad was called a demon often uh, out in public because that's just how they viewed him. My mom couldn't get a job and the church there didn't pay much, and my mom applied for job after job, but she couldn't work because she wasn't Mormon. Nobody would hire her in that era. And finally, she got on as an assistant uh, in an oil company, just a, a secretary, um, which was not what she was really geared for, but she did it. And a couple of years later, after I got through college, uh, I found out that she'd been promoted several times, and a couple of years later, I see her uh, make a trip on a corporate jet and I said, Mom, what, how do you get on that corporate jet? She said, well, I'm now VP of sales. I said, sales over what? She said, over all the oil sales in the United States of this company. I said, what? <laughs> how did you do that? You know, when you're a kid growing up, you have no idea the skills your mom has. You know, she can cook grilled cheese sandwiches and waffles on Sunday morning. That's about all you know. <laughs> but amazing. And she was placed in this company. And eventually, the president of this company said, you know, because of your influence, because of your witness for Christ, I can't really explain how you got in the role you're in, but I want to give my life to the Christ you serve, which seems to be different from the God I serve because of your influence. I would consider that my mom was like a turtle on a fence post. I would consider that what God did with her life and what God does with all of our lives is place us in a certain point in life, place in life where we can influence other people. I want you to see that in the life of Esther, but I also want you to see that in all of our lives. We had a chance to video a few people over recent weeks. They're holding in their hands a turtle and they're talking about the idea of a turtle on a fence post. Watch this for a moment. Years ago, my wife heard a preacher named Joe Stowe preach and the idea that he preached one day was that God places us in unique places at unique times and we didn't get there on our own. And he posed a question in his message that we have talked about for years now. And the question is, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there on his own. If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there on his own. Someone put him there. My name is Stephanie, and God has put me in the medical field caring for children and their families. I'm Gail. God put me working for the government in human resources. Hi, I'm Deanna, and God has placed me in the most diverse school district in the nation to teach high school students. I'm Carly, and God has chose to put me out of gym with other gymnasts training to compete at meets and competitions. Hey y'all, it's Leslie. God has placed me in my home, raising my children to be world changers, and in their school to have an impact on their teachers and their friends. Hi, I'm Levada. I'm a retired Army veteran, and God is using me to serve my local church and global missions. Hi, I'm Rose, I'm a teacher, and my place of influence is everywhere. I'm Taryn, and God has put me in my student choir to work with other singers. Hi, I'm Claudia, and God has put me in leadership roles and organizations on campus, serving the students in my community. I 
I love those stories. I love those stories because those stories remind us that every single person has a significant role in life. In fact, you know, today, because this is the book of Esther, I want you to turn to a woman nearby. Whether you're a woman or a man, you turn to a woman near you and just say, you are significant. I want you to look at them eye, their eyes and say that right now. Would you do that? All throughout, you are significant. And that's just the truth of the matter. And the message of Esther is you don't even know maybe sometimes how big a role God has for you in that place where you are. I want you to see yourself as an Esther. I want you to see yourself as an individual that's placed where you're placed for a divine reason, for a reason that you may not understand. You may not know when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. Just trust that God knows. He knows the end game here. And it is a long game not just how you impact someone today, but in the long run. So we learn from the book of Esther the power and influence of a great woman, and that's undeniable. Secondly, we learn the eventual judgment of evil is certain. Eventually, God will judge evil. It's coming. In chapter 7, verse 10, you have that line that's so stark, where Haman has uh, made a fool of himself. Esther has exposed him. King Ahasuerus is about to make a judgment. In verse 10, it says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. I mean, that's almost a raw, raw moment for me. I mean, I'm not an angry guy. I'm not a violent guy. But the truth is, I was really glad to see chapter 7, verse 10 happen. You know why? Because the rise of evil was happening. Haman was just being elevated. He was having freedom to do whatever he wanted to do. His hatred, his racism, all that was just pouring out against the Jews. And I was really glad to see chapter 7, verse 10 happen because for me, that represents God's judgment finally taking place on evil. It's not that we rejoice in the death of anyone. It's that we rejoice that God's justice is served. Here's the deal. This key moment happened because God's values and God's work were being violated by an evil man. And you might want to violate some person's agenda, but you don't violate God's agenda without justice happening. All through the Bible, we have a consistent story that God will eventually judge evil. And if you summarize the book of Esther, Haman and the nation of Persia were misogynist. They were objectifying women. They were racist. They were wicked. They were evil in every sense of the word. They were murderous and they were conspiratorial. They did everything they could to pour out their will, their, their, uh, their way of life, or their desire for Mordecai and the Jews to be eradicate, eradicated. And at some point, judgment was inevitable. But, but you have to ask this question as you walk through this book. When will God judge wickedness? Why does he wait? Have you ever asked that question? Why is it that God waits? Why does he hold back his judgment from the most wicked, most atrocious things happening on the planet? Why would God wait with his judgment? I've asked that question a lot. When I read the news, sometimes I ask, God, why did you allow this to happen? Why did evil fall upon this person? Why is this allowed to be taking place? Why don't you intervene? When are you going to stop this? If you're a God of justice, when are you going to stop this? Why does God wait? Let me just talk about that for just a moment because it's an important question. God and his character are very unique things for us because God doesn't operate like a human being. God's character is that he is a just judge. He is a God who will bring justice to unjust situations, but he's also a merciful God and a loving God. And because of his mercy, it tempers the timing of his justice. His justice will always occur. But God's character is like two sides of that coin. It's it's who God is. And as you look at certain situations unfold, you ask the question, why is God waiting? And part of the answer, even though we don't know all of it, part of the answer is God is waiting because of his patience, because of his long suffering. Listen to something that I think helps us understand. Rick Renner said this in one of his devotional books. He said, the word long suffering is from the Greek word makrothumia. It's a common word we find in the New Testament. 
And it's a compound of a couple of words. One of those words means simply long and the other describes great patience. So this word describes God's long and great patience. So one of the exegetical keys for this in the New Testament says this, I'm quoting it. It is the spirit who could take revenge at any moment, but who also utterly refuses to do so. The delay of God's punishment rests on God's long suffering. Close quote. So here's the truth that I share with you. In other words, God is exceedingly patient with those who are unsaved. He is willing to wait for the redemption of that one last person who will repent when we're talking about the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, God is exceedingly patient for those who could turn, who could repent. He's waiting on them because of his mercy towards even people like Haman. Would God's mercy extend to even to a person like Haman? The answer is yes, for a time. Here's the deal about God's character, God's justice and God's mercy. We never know where that line is. We never know when God's gonna say enough. I have tolerated this in my patience and my long suffering. I've tolerated this in my kindness, but at some point that line is drawn and once a person crosses that line, it's over and God's justice begins to happen. That's the frightening thing about God and us not knowing where that line is. I have to tell you this, I have a confession to make as I was growing up, there were, there were things I was involved with as a, as a late, in my late teenage years and I knew God and I knew God loved me and I knew God's mercy and I knew at some point God's justice would run out in my life and I was always a little concerned about where that line was. And that kept the fear of God in my life enough to where God was able to use that in my life. Where is God when evil unfolds? God's still there. But God's justice is tempered by his long suffering. But at some point, just in the life, as in the life of Haman and in every life, God will judge evil. You can write it down. You can read it in your Bible. God will judge evil. You need to know this. In the world we live in, it's necessary to remember that God judges evil. When I read my Bible, I read the book of Genesis where he cast even Adam and Eve out of the garden because of sin. He banished Cain because he murdered his brother. That was God's justice. God's justice took place when he sent the flood and he saved Noah, but all the others were under the judgment of God. Sodom was destroyed because of God's judgment raining fire down from heaven. He sent the plagues to Egypt and parted the seas as those people followed Israel and his judgment happened. The ground opened up and swallowed Korah and those sons of Korah in the rebellion against Moses, God judged them. The walls of Jericho fell because God judged Canaan and Canaanite during that moment. They crumbled because of his justice. He judged the Philistines through the slingshot of David because he said, enough, you've embarrassed my people long enough. Over and over and over, he judged Israel's oppressors. Read your Bible. God judges evil. Yes. Trusting to do that in the right time. And then in the fullness of time, God judged all of sin when he sent his own Savior who came as a suffering servant to die and hang on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind. There's God's justice poured out upon Jesus for our sakes. You want God's justice to happen, but you also want his mercy to be experienced. Trust him with that. And the truth we have from the book of Esther is that the eventual judgment of evil is certain. And what God did was he reversed everything that was happening, everything wickedness had done. God turned to the contrary. He flipped it upside down because God is the kind of God that makes all the wrong things right. He sets things in order that need to be set in order. And let me ask you to walk away today, at least with this mindset, whatever's out of order in your life, whatever needs judging in your life, whatever evil's coming against you, God will flip it over at some point, at some time. Trust him for that. Trust him for that. He's a God of justice. But then there's one more thing we walk away with today, and this is really what happens in chapter 9. It's so incredibly important that Esther does. You know, Esther is not heard of after the book of Esther. We don't hear of her. We don't know if she had any children with King Ahasuerus or with anyone else. We just don't hear of her anymore. But you know, the Jews practiced something 
25 years after her reign called Purim. It means Thanksgiving. It's incredible. Look at chapter 9, verse 28. Refresh your memory is what we said there. The Bible says that Esther made this decree. So these days were to be remembered. That word is key, remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. And these days of Purim were not to fail from among the Jews or their memory fade from their descendants. So this is not a law that originated in the book of Deuteronomy or Exodus or from Moses. This is Esther who said the Jewish people from this day forward, 2,500 years and counting, should celebrate this. The deliverance that God gave us from our captors, from those who wished us dead. Wow. So Purim today is celebrated. And Purim means thanksgiving and deliverance. Now, my point is the practice of giving thanks is weighty. God says, I want all my people to learn this practice of thanksgiving because evil is going to come and go. And I'm going to be silent sometimes, invisible sometimes, but always present. In the end, you can know that I'm going to bring about justice and mercy at the same time. But you need to be always looking with an attitude, a mindset of thanksgiving. And it's weighty because it balances, counterbalances the hard times in our life, the challenging, disturbing moments where we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, where we don't know how it's going to end up, when we don't know what God's going to do, whether it's going to be favorable towards us or horrible towards us, when we don't know, that's when Thanksgiving is so critical. Two things that you need to know. Before God intervenes, we're to give thanks in faith. Before he even intervenes, God's word commands us to give thanks. Philippians chapter four, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. You know the result of that? And the peace of God that passes all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I know this. I know that if I ask God to do something in my life without thanksgiving, the peace of God doesn't prevail in my life. But if I ask God to be at work in my life and in my situations and all the things that are going on, with thanksgiving, peace prevails because then I'm saying, God, I trust you with the outcome, not just with my solution, but with your solution to the outcome. So I'm going to say, as soon as I say what I need, I'm going to say, and thank you for however you're going to fix this. However you're going to make this work. Be anxious for nothing. Man, what an antidote. Anybody ever anxious about anything? Raise your hand if you're anxious about something every once in a while. Oh my goodness, all of us. You may have had an incredible week of Thanksgiving, had family and friends there and walked away disappointed with some things about your celebration, disappointed with some things about your life or your family or the progress or their faith or whatever it is. I know what you're talking about, but our prayer is this. Our prayer is, God, whatever you have to do in their life, do it, but I'm gonna give thanks to you for what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You have to have that mindset. Let me tell you why that's so important. Because it's possible That the problem is never going to be solved until your attitude about the problem is fixed. It's possible that the attitude you have about your problem and about your challenges, about the things that face you, it's possible that your attitude becomes bigger than the problem. Because you're mad at God, you're mad at people, you're upset, you're anxious, you're stressed out. Everything else is happening to you because you don't know the end game. You don't know how God is going to work at the end. And what God wants to do is bring you back to a place where you can hear him, see him, know he's at work and trust that he's going to have the answer. Sometimes we need reminders of that. Think about what Esther must have been thinking in chapter 3. Think about what Mordecai must have been thinking in chapter 3. They had to get to the place where they say, God, we're just going to trust you even if it means giving our lives. I remember years ago, I was driving to a place to preach. My wife was in the car with me. Kim is always uh, that quiet yet sometimes very prophetic voice that I need in my life. And uh, I was complaining to her about somebody that had offended me, hurt me with things they'd done and said. And and, uh, I'm not much of a complainer, but I was that day and I was to her. So I was complaining on the way to a preaching assignment, right? That's never a good recipe. (laughs) That's not gonna be a good message, but I was still doing it. And I remember we were an hour or two out and she said, well, you know, you're gonna have to forgive them. 
I said, yeah, I know I'm gonna have to do that. She goes, no, you're gonna have to forgive him right now. And I said, excuse me, uh, you telling me when I have to forgive him? She goes, yeah, you're about to preach. And so if you're gonna have any way of all, at all of God using you, you're gonna have to forgive him right now. You know, I just, I just uh, don't like it sometimes when she tells me the truth about things. <laughs> I said, you know, you're right. And I had to work through that forgiveness before I ever got there. And then what God was doing through her was telling me that the problem was not the problem, the problem was my attitude towards the problem. And once I got that attitude taken care of, you know, God did whatever he needed to do to that other person and for that other person, but he needed to get me in my heart right. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. But not only do we do that before God works, but after God intervenes, we're to give thanks in remembrance. That's where that word comes in. That's the way we talk about spiritual things in our homes. We go home and we say, remember what God did in our lives. We remember how God provided. Remember how God saved you. Remember how God brought you uh, a miracle in your life. Remember how God healed you. Remember how God directed you. And you give thanks to the God who did that because what that does is it lets you never be out of touch with the amazing power of God. It lets you walk forward with an attitude of amazing thanksgiving. So look at Esther and Mordecai. Now the Jews are saved. Now Esther is queen. Now Mordecai is second in command. And Esther said, give thanks. Not only give thanks today, but give thanks tomorrow. And every year about this time, we're gonna give thanks to God with a feast. And their feast was very much like our Thanksgiving. They did a day of fasting, which we do not do. And then they did a, a day of feasting, which we do. And they ate together and they celebrated what God did. And then they went out to find people less fortunate than them. And they poured their lives for a space of a day into other people to remind themselves of how good God is remembrance. When's the last time you celebrated the goodness of God? When's the last time you celebrated the goodness of all that God has done in your life? When's the last time in the middle of your challenge and your difficult moment when you said, you know what, this seems difficult, but I've seen God work for years and decades and decades, and I know God's history with my life, with my family. I know God's history in the Bible. I am trusting God. When's the last time you did that and walked away different. Psalms chapter 100 and all five verses are a great, great remembrance for us. I'm going to put it on the screen because I want us to say it out loud together. Would you do that with me? Psalm 100 verse 1. Here's how it begins. Just begin with me. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his, thanksgiving, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. You believe that? Say amen. That's God. That's who God is. That's how God works. Esther said, until, until the end of our existence, we're going to give thanks to God. And when you read the Bible, you see those admonitions all the way through it, 292 times the word praise, praise the Lord. 234 times rejoice in the Lord. 193 times give thanks to God. 30 times the word thanksgiving is used. Give thanks to God. We're to praise him when we sing, when we simply say words of praise, when we are praying. We're to praise him with our testimonies, with musical instruments, with remembrance, with declaring his work. We're to do this everywhere because we need to remember the goodness of God in our life. Thanksgiving is a mindset, it's an attitude, it's what we ought to have day in and day out in order to see God work the way only he can work in our lives. Kevin and I were talking about Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm, which everybody knows, and she's kind of doing an in-depth study, and she said, she is fixed on that line, my cup runneth over. She said, I'm just going over and over that line. I'm seeing the ways that God has poured out his faithfulness, even to the place where our cup runs over. And even though sometimes we feel like our cup is half empty or half full, that's not what the Bible says. It says it's running over. And she said, do you think Esther, at the end of the story, 
felt like her cup was running over, and I said, oh, absolutely. You think Mordecai at the end of this horrific story felt like his cup was running over? Oh, absolutely, com completely. Well, what about all the Jewish people that at one point had the death sentence written over them, and now they were actually the victors, and they were actually living in peace and prosperity? What about them? Their cup was running over. What an incredible opportunity for us to say, I'm going to have a reset of attitude and mindset. My cup is running over. Because it is if you have Christ. And it always will be if you have him. I'll ask you to stand with me as we conclude our service today. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to repeat some things after me. You know, one thing Brother Bill used to do a lot, Bill Anderson would ask people just to repeat a few affirmations. And I, I always thought that was a cool thing as he led us through uh, different lines that uh, were on his heart. I never got the sense that Bill knew what he was going to say before he said it, but we all trusted him and so we all said it. And that's how we're going to end today. We're going to end today with just affirmation. I'm going to ask our, our prayer counselor and our prayer team to come to the front. It may be at the end of the service. If you want to come and talk to them today, they're going to be available here to talk to you. I'm going to invite those who are our guests to go to the guest reception room. I'd like to talk to you there. I'm going to remind you to give your Thanksgiving offering before you leave today. Just give it to the ushers as you leave. But I want you to say these words with me. I'm going to share them and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me just short phrases at a time as an act of worship to the Lord. Are you ready? Can you do that? You trust me? <laughs> Here they are. I am grateful. I'm grateful for my trials. I'm grateful for my hardships. I'm thankful for my endurance. Thank you, God, for your promise. Thank you for your commitment to me. Thank you for your reputation. Thank you for your grace. I believe you and give thanks. Even before you show the answer. Even before you intervene. I give thanks to you. I will be anxious for nothing. I'll give it all to you. And I'll give thanks to you. Because I believe you. And I believe that you have good for my life. So be it, Lord Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name today, as we close this service, as we leave today with an attitude of thanksgiving, Father, I pray that all of us in this room will allow that adjustment to be made no matter what we're facing, no matter how difficult, how unthinkable the situation may be that we're in. Lord, you're able. And Lord, today we have affirmed those things, that we believe you, that we trust you, that we even thank you right now before we know the answer. God, you have uh, the ability to do anything way beyond our solutions. Your solutions are sure. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.